turn your Bibles to John chapter 8, find verse 7. We'll read this, it's breaking into a part of the story. But it says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. The title of our message this morning is, Throw a Stone at Her. That is a command. It is in there. Jesus did say, throw a stone at her. So let's examine this command and see what is going on here and what we learn from it. The specific case referenced here was a woman caught in adultery. In fact, verse 4 says, in the very act of adultery. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus in an attempt to trap him between his compassion for people and the law of Moses, which was explicit on how to handle adulterers. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it specifically says, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That very plain, very straightforward. There's no, well, if this situation exists, and if this, that, and the other thing, you just, hey, if there's adultery, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. It says, shall surely be put to death. You will notice from the context of our story that this event happened early in the morning. Jesus was seated in the temple teaching the people. The scribes and the Pharisees interrupted this peaceful gathering in a manner as to bring as much embarrassment to Jesus as possible. The object they are after. Was he going to disregard the law of Moses? Or was he going to approve the execution of this woman? They had this in their mind. And I think deep down in their hearts they figured that he was going to pass over this sin. Because, you know, they had seen him forgiving sins all over the place. So they were thinking, aha, uh -huh, we've got him because the law of Moses says she shall surely be put to death. So they thought they had the perfect trap. They planned to use whatever his response was to discredit him in the eyes of the people there in the temple. Matthew Henry comments on this event. He writes, The case proposed to him by the scribes and Pharisees who herein contrived to pick a quarrel with him and bring him into a snare. They sent the prisoner to the bar. They brought him a woman taken in adultery, perhaps now lately taken during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles when it may be their dwelling in booths and their feasting and joy might by wicked minds which corrupt the best things be made occasions of sin. Those that were taken in adultery were by the Jewish law to be put to death, which the Roman powers allowed them the execution of. And therefore she was brought before the ecclesiastical court. Observe, she was taken in her adultery. Though adultery is a work of darkness, which the criminals commonly take all the care they can to conceal, yet sometimes it is strangely brought to light. Those that promise themselves secrecy and sin deceive themselves. That's, that's so true. Uh, Matthew Henry lived a long time ago. He was a Presbyterian minister, but he had this insight into the things of God. It's so true. Those that promise themselves Secrecy and sin deceive themselves. The scribes and Pharisees bringing her to Christ 
and set her in the midst of the assembly as if they would leave her wholly to the judgment of Christ, he having sat down as a judge upon the bench. Now, Adam Clark comments on the manner of execution by stoning as practiced by the Jews. I'm sure you have seen biblical movies where they are throwing rocks at people and stoning them. Um, the Jewish custom was a little bit different than what you actually see in the movies. He says, the Jewish method of stoning, according to the rabbins, was as follows. The culprit, half naked, the hands tied behind the back, was placed on a scaffold 10 or 12 feet high. The witnesses who stood with her pushed her off with great force. If she was killed by the fall, there was nothing further done. But if she was not, one of the witnesses took up a very large stone and dashed it upon her breast, which generally was the coup de grace, or finishing stroke. You notice in Leviticus it didn't say stone them, it says shall surely be put to death. And this was the methodology that the Jews used. Certainly not a very nice way to die. I would think if you were caught in this situation, you would rather die from the fall off the scaffold than have someone throw a big rock on your chest and, and crush the life out of you. So upon hearing their demand for him to pass judgment, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. Now there is much conjecture as to what Jesus wrote. It obviously was pertinent to the situation at hand, but for some reason, the Holy Spirit did not move the Apostle John to record what Jesus wrote. So as to what Jesus wrote, I can only add conjecture to conjecture. My reasoning is thus. It takes two to commit adultery. And the law said that both the man and the woman were to be put to death. There is no mention of the man involved here in our story from the Gospel of John. So my imagine takes in that Jesus wrote something like this. Where is the man? Where is the man? You know the law. That's why you're here. You expect me to judge this case? You're going to test me on this? You brought the woman. You said you caught her in the very act. Where is the man? This was Jesus' signal to them that he knew exactly what they were trying to do. Jesus was no dummy. He understood what they were up to. He knew that they were trying to catch them in a trap. The scribes and the Pharisees did not care a hoot about what Jesus thought. They were intent on discrediting him. So they kept pressing him to give them an answer everyone present could hear. To their chagrin, Jesus told them to go ahead and execute her. He said, throw a stone at her. You brought her. She's guilty. Throw a stone at her. You get the picture of why he said throw a stone? Didn't mean pick up a little rock off the ground and throw it at her. But it has reference to taking this big rock and dropping it on her and crushing the life out of her. But he prefaced his answer with a condition that makes sense under the circumstance. Because he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So yeah, go ahead and throw a stone at her. If 
you are without sin. And then he again stooped down and wrote on the ground, Where is the man? It wasn't that Jesus was against sinners standing in judgment over other sinners. After all, we have judges and juries that are made up of people who have past or present sin in their lives. So if we eliminate people that have sinned from our juries and jurisprudence, there could be no due process of justice in any country. So just having sin in a person's life does not say they can't be involved in passing judgment. The point Jesus makes here is that the scribes and Pharisees were breaking the very law they were trying to enforce. Maybe you've not thought about this as you've read through this. They were breaking the very law they were trying to enforce. That's why Jesus said, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first one to throw a stone. They were breaking the very law. The law required that both the man and the woman were to be executed. So apparently, they were going to let the man off and execute just the woman. Had this been what we would call a setup from the beginning? Had this adultery been planned? Had one of their own men been involved? She was caught in the very act. Where was the man? For them to let the adulterous man go free was the same as participating in the adultery he committed. They were willing to execute her, but they were going to let him off. So they were actually participating in the sin of adultery as committed by the man. Jesus makes it plain to them that they are adulterers by proxy wanting to an ex execute an adulterous woman. He's letting them know you're no different than this woman. You may not have physically committed adultery, but you have, per, uh, you have participated in the act through the setup by what you are doing here. And you are breaking the very law of Moses you are trying to enforce. Friends, this is hypocrisy of the highest degree. Now let's come forward to our day and age. American Christians have adopted a philosophy of tolerance that does not permit judgment of any kind. Matthew 7, 1 has become the message of the gospel, replacing John 3, 16. In case you don't know what Matthew 7, 1 says, it says, judge not that you be not judged. And it appears that this now has higher value among modern Christians than does reaching sinners with the message of salvation from sin. You see, political correctness has invaded the church. Political correctness has perverted the message of the gospel. Have you ever wondered why we don't see revival in this country? Could it be that we have become so tolerant of sin that we are afraid to tell sinners they are lost and in need of salvation? Shame on us. Shame on those who profess to be Christians when they are so tolerant of sin, when they are so afraid of offending people that they can't share the real gospel with those who need to hear it. Christians have given in to the teaching that we are all sinners to the degree they comprehend very little difference between themselves and the lost. 
other than that they go to church and the others do not. That's sad. Do you realize that Jesus actually taught that we are to judge the actions of others? Jesus, when he said, judge not that you be not judged, that's not all of what he said. There's more to that. I'm not going to read that. But I'm going to read where Jesus specifically tells us that we are to judge. In John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance. See, you're not supposed to judge, right? No, no, that's not what he's saying. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We are to judge, not based on the appearance of things, but we are to judge with righteous judgment. The situation Jesus is dealing with there in the seventh chapter, he was pointing out to some people that the law of Moses actually contained a contradiction. He points out that you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. But he tells them the law also says you are to circumcise a child on the eighth day even if that day is the Sabbath. So there's a contradiction. Do no work on the Sabbath. But you are to circumcise a child on the Sabbath if that is the eighth day after he's been born. That's a conundrum. How do you resolve that? That's a conflict. Adam Clark comments on this. Judge not according to the appearance. Attend to the law. Not merely in the letter, but in the spirit and design. Learn that the law which commands men to rest on the Sabbath day is subordinate to the law of mercy and love, which requires them to be ever active to promote God's glory in the comfort and salvation of their fellow creatures and endeavor to judge of the merit or demerit of an action, not from the first impression it may make upon your prejudices, but from its tendency and the motives of the person as far as it is possible for you to acquaint yourselves with them, still believing the best where you have no certain proof to the contrary. Well, that's a lot of formal language, isn't it? <laughs> but he's telling us to judge righteous judgment. Don't judge just based on a first impression. Don't judge based on your personal prejudices or your personal ideas. But look, what is going on here? What is the common practice of the person? Do you know what this person always does? Does this person always tell lies? Or did this person just make a misstatement? If you don't know, it's best to hold back. Judge righteous judgment. Albert Barnes says of righteous judgment, candidly, looking at the law and inquiring what its spirit really requires. That word candidly means honestly. You are to be honest when you are looking at somebody's behavior and judging things to be honest. So we can put all this that we just said into words that are more colloquial terms for us. We can say, what is the real issue? What is the real issue? We are to judge righteous judgment. What is the real issue going on here? It is true that some things are right and some things are wrong. When people do wrong things, they must be held accountable for the wrong things they do. Amen? Okay. 
See, in our culture, we aren't really holding to that anymore. Political correctness says, well, what's wrong to me might not be wrong to you. So I can't judge you. Well, why is it if the speed limit says 35 and you're driving 70 through that area, policeman's going to stop you and he's going to give you a citation. Maybe, you know, in your mind, you might say, well, it's not wrong for me to drive 70 miles an hour on this road. Look, there's nobody here. Well, there's a law, there's a rule. But I don't see it as being wrong. It doesn't make sense to drive 35 miles an hour through there. Is the policeman being politically incorrect? Because he stops you and gives you a citation and you have to make a payment of a fine? Some things are right and some things are wrong. They will always be right. They will always be wrong. In the story that we're reading, adultery is always wrong. Oh, they really love each other. Hogwash. Adultery is wrong. It's sin. But was it God said in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not commit adultery? Right. You know, and Jesus even took that to its moral root. Mm -hmm. He said, if you look on a person with an intent, with an intent, with an intent, even though you don't physically do the act, you are guilty before God. It is wrong. It has always been wrong. It is wrong now. It will always be wrong. So, people must be held accountable for the wrong that they do. Now, if you see something and you're not sure what the person did is really wrong, it is best to hold your peace. Sometimes we get in on the, the end of a conversation, we hear something that we didn't hear the first part, we can prejudge. Or we can see somebody doing something and we don't really know why they're doing or really what they're doing, but our perception is that, oh, that person's doing something wrong. Are you sure? Are you sure? What is the real issue here? What is going on? When we know for sure, that is a time to speak up. When we don't know for sure, it's time for us to hold our peace and let God reveal what needs to be real, revealed, if anything, if anything. Some people just do not like to confront other people about the wrong things they do. And by wrong things, I mean sins. Sins. As Christians, we tend to think that telling them will offend them. And we will lose the opportunity to win them to the Lord. That just doesn't make sense. Why do we need to win them to the Lord? Well, because they're sinners. Well, then we need to tell them that they're sinners. Well, we can't do that because we might offend them. Well, if we don't tell them they're sinners, how are we going to win them to the Lord? Do you see you have an impossible situation? I think what most modern Christians think about it is winning them to the Lord means that you get them to come to church. And somehow they magically get right in church. Or just coming to church makes them right. That's not so. They're not made right until they have had a real conversion experience with God. Where they have repented of their sins and been born again of the Holy Spirit of God and been made a new creature in Christ. You see, we buy into Satan's lie that sinners will think that we think that we are better than they are, and that we are somehow superior because we are Christians. People out there in the churches of Lawton have been fed that lie. And that is a lie 
from the pits of hell. He's saying Satan doesn't want us going out here publishing the gospel. Satan doesn't want us going out here telling people that they need to be saved from their sins. The truth is that most sinners carry a load of guilt over the things they have done which they know are wrong. Yes, initially, they may be upset when we tell them they are sinners and they are in need of salvation. And they may even say to us, who are you to judge me? But inwardly, honest people who are under the conviction of the Holy Spirit are thankful that someone cares enough to tell them. Did you hear what I said? They're thankful that someone cares enough to tell them. How many sinners are going to die lost? And their complaint is going to be, why didn't someone care enough to tell me about Jesus, about salvation from sin? to tell me that what I was doing in my life was wrong, to tell me that I was headed for an eternal hell. Why didn't someone tell me? And when they come to Christ for salvation, they will always be grateful for the one who cared enough to tell them the truth. If you share the gospel with someone, if you have to confront someone about sin in their lives and they get saved from sin, they're going to be so grateful that you cared enough for them, that you really loved them and you told them they're wrong. You need to be saved. Say, you do need to throw a stone to wake them up. But giving heed to Jesus' command, if we are to cast a stone, if we are called upon to speak God's judgment on someone's sin, we must ourselves not be guilty of sin, especially the same sin. You are the churchgoer at the place where you work. And you have a habit of bending the truth and coloring the truth, telling white lies. People know that. How can you criticize your coworker for telling a lie? You can't. Because you're guilty of the same. You can't throw a stone. It may seem like a high standard, not guilty of sin, especially the same sin. But it's the same standard that Jesus put on those scribes and Pharisees. They were guilty of adultery by proxy. And they were wanting to condemn and destroy this woman who was an adulteress. Jesus is telling them essentially, you can't do it because you're guilty of the sin she committed. If your life is not a holy life and the sinner sees your inconsistencies and any sins that might be there, your testimony and your effort to help them will fail. Sinners tend to think all Christians are hypocrites. Do not give them ground to believe they are correct in that perception. Remember what Proverbs 25, 11 says. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Your life and your behavior is that setting. Let it be silver. Let it be pure silver. When it is so, 
the words you speak will be like apples of gold to those who need the love and mercy of God in their 